So uh, my name is Nick Anderson. I'm Assistant Professor in Biomedical Informatics. I'm also Associate Director of the uh, Institute of Translational Health Sciences Biomedical Informatics Core. It's my pleasure today, to, on behalf of ITHS, to welcome another ITHS interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary grand rounds. So ITHS is a multi-institutional organization unique to the UW, involves Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, Seattle Children's Research Institute, Group Health Research Institute, and other organizations in the Northwest and across the Wawami area. Our mission is to facilitate the process of moving or translating basic research concepts into clinical applications and eventually improving the health of the public. Uh, the Education Corps of ITHS has been sponsoring these interdisciplinary grand rounds to highlight contemporary issues in the health sciences that are multidisciplinary in nature, may be controversial, and could benefit from discussions and points of view from several disciplines. Today's topic is over-the-counter genetic testing. Several months ago, a large drug drugstore chain announced that they would start offering genetic tests for sale directly to the public. Shortly thereafter, the FDA required that the companies back off these plans subject to FDA examination of the evidence surrounding such genetic testing. One week ago, on Black Friday, 23andMe, a web-based genetic testing company, uh, offered the ability to get your genome sequenced for $99, down from the usual price of $499. Uh, based on these events, it appears that OTC genetic counseling genetic tests will soon become readily available. And the question to the, today's uh, uh, presenters will be, are we ready for that? So we're going to address these issues with three speakers from a very unique and different backgrounds. Uh, Roger Baumgartner will speak first. He's Associate Professor of Microbiology, Director of the Center for Array Technologies at the University of Washington, as well as Co-Director of the Translational Technologies Core for the ITHS. His research focuses on the application of genomics and bioinformatics to a wide variety of biological problems, and he will address the technology involved in these tests, as well as discuss some of the issues associated with interpreting the results. Anna Mastriani uh, teaches health law and bioethics in the School of Law and the Institute of Public Health Genetics. She has appointments in the Department of Health Services, School of Public Health and Community Medicine, as well as the Department of Bioethics and Humanities, School of Medicine, and she will address the regulatory and legal issues. Ben Wilfond is a physician as well as director of the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics at Seattle Children's, professor in chief of the Division of Bioethics in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Washington School of Medicine, and adjunct professor in the Department of Bioethics and Humanities. He also co-directs the regulatory support and bioethics core of the ITHS and will address ethics of testing issues and issues in interpretation. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Roger Baumgartner to, to, for the first presentation on a direct computer consumer genetic testing. All right, thanks, Nick. So I'm going to start out with a disclaimer. I want to point out that I'm going to show slides from a variety of websites that are commercial, and neither myself nor the UW uh, endorses any specific direct-to-consumer genetic testing method. I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about the overview. We're going to talk about what is direct-to-consumer genetic testing, a little bit about how the tests are performed. Then we're going to talk about how the gen genetic diseases are associated with the markers that are being tested for. Finally, we'll talk a little bit about the test accuracy and the test utility, and then I'll leave you with a slide on uh, some of the concerns uh, from a scientific perspective with genetic testing of this sort. So the promise of direct-to-consumer genetic testing uh, is shown in this slide. This is one from Pathway Genomics, a commercial company. Uh, and the idea is that your genes hold the story of your health, and if you read through the slide, it'll say your family lifestyle and history uh, influence your health, but your genes are also influential. And it's now possible to know the story of your genes so that you can make proactive choices uh, regarding your health. So that's the promise. And if you look at a variety of different uh, DTC companies, you'll find similar statements of uh, this sort on their websites. So what is direct-to-consumer genetic testing? Uh, in general, it consists of a process where an individual orders or obtains a test kit from a, the direct direct-to-consumer testing company uh, and orders the desired test. And there's a few variations on this. Uh, some companies require you to get the kit through their uh, physicians. Some companies will allow you to simply order it over the net. Uh, you obtain a sample of your DNA, and typically this is saliva, but it could be blood. Uh, DNA is extracted from the sample and tested for the presence or absence of genetic markers at hundreds of thousands of locations within the genome. And then the results are provided to you directly over the web. So most of these tests measure what's called single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are single base pair changes in, the, uh, in your DNA or in the genome. And between any two individuals, our DNA varies about one base pair in a thousand across the genome. So there's many, many of these markers since our genome is about three billion base pairs long. 
There's a variety of ways that the SNPs are measured. Uh, I'm going to show you a very oversimplified view. But in brief, genomic DNA is isolated from your sample. It's fragmented into relatively small chunks. And then it's bound to a thing called a DNA microarray. And a DNA microarray is simply a physical service that has printed on it many, many different DNA sequences. And in this case, I'm showing two DNA sequences that are related, but they're different by one base pair at the end. Then when your test DNA is hybridized or bound to this slide, depending upon which base, base pair is present in your test DNA, it will bind to uh, one or more of these sites. And we can measure that by measuring fluorescence on the site. Now, there's variations on the technology. Most of the arrays made by Affymetrics actually have the variant uh, nucleotide in the middle. Uh, some other arrays will have an extension done where there's a chemical reaction done that extends the, the DNA on the array one nucleotide to cross the variant nucleotide in the genome. Uh, these come in a variety of different formats. The two most common ones are from Affymetrics and Illumina. Uh, the one that's shown in the upper left hand corner of this slide from Affymetrics physically is about this large. So relatively small. They typically have hundreds of thousands to millions of different sequences on them. Uh, and typically about a million different SNPs are measured. Uh, the slides range in cost from tens of dollars to a few hundred dollars, depending upon company and volume. And the DNA binding is usually detected by fluorescent imaging. But the bottom line is these chips measure SNPs very accurately. Now, one of the things that we're interested in, though, is not whether or not the SNP is measured, uh, but how are the SNPs associated with genetic diseases. We're going to assume that we can measure them very accurately. Well, the way that SNPs get associated with genetic diseases is through a variety of different studies performed predominantly in the research community. And the two primary methods used to identify SNPs uh, that are responsible or associated with genetic disease are what's called linkage analysis tests or whole, and whole, gene, whole genome association studies. Linkage analysis tests involve looking for variations in DNA that are consistently inherited in families uh, with the trait of interest. Uh, typically, these are studies that are analyzing a trait that's fairly easy to follow, a trait that's fairly large, or a, f a risk factor that's fairly large. And they're typically analyzing tens to hundreds of individuals. Whole genome uh, association studies, on the other hand, are often used to look for smaller effects, variations in the genome that give you a slight increase in risk. Uh, and typically, these are looking at thousands of individuals. But the net result of either of these studies is that we get a statistical probability that a given genetic variant is associated with a given disease. And we also oftentimes get a measure of how strong that association is or how uh, penetrant the disease is. So if you have a given SNP or a given genetic variant, we can say that this variant gives you an 88% chance of getting the disease, or this variant only gives you a modest increase in risk where the likelihood of getting the disease is fairly small to begin with. And there's a big range in that. One thing I want to point out is that different studies use different study populations and uh, different statistical methods to test the data. So depending upon which studies you look at, how you integrate those studies together, and how you do the statistics on those uh, data sets, you may get somewhat different values for these probabilities. And those probability values can range pretty dramatically, in fact. So on this slide, what I'm trying to show you is that uh, disease causes are very complex. And on the right side, we have some diseases that are uh, dominant diseases, highly penetrant diseases, diseases with a single gene disorder. And those are relatively easy to test. But in general, those uh, disorders are fairly rare. The things that we care about most, the things that have the biggest impact on our health burden, like obesity and diabetes and heart disease, uh, those things have much, much smaller associations with genetics, but they do have some association with genetics, but they're much more common. And so we have a range of diseases that there's a small number where it's very easy to get a definitive test or nearly definitive test, and a large number where uh, we get a somewhat less definitive test. And just to give you a couple of examples here, uh, Huntington's disease is a common uh, disease that's tested for genetics. And it's a dominant disease caused by an increase in the length of a trinucleotide repeat. So these are three base pairs that are repeated uh, multiple times. 
And if you have more than 40 copies of this repeat, there's a 100% chance that you're going to show symptoms of this disease. So here's an example where a genetic test could measure this and give you a very high predictive value of getting the disease. On the other hand, we know some disease genes are some genes that are associated with obesity. Uh, for example, there's a genotype of a specific gene, the FTO gene, and that accounts for about six pounds of weight difference between individuals who have one variant of the gene and individuals who have another variant of the gene. So if you measure a bunch of individuals with this variant and a bunch of individuals with this variant, the average weight difference between them is six pounds, even though there might be skinny ones in this group and skinny ones in this group, the, on average the difference is six pounds. But obesity we know is very complicated. And here's just a chart showing the obesity in the U.S. as a function of time from 1990 to 2009. And what you can see is it's gone from having a relatively small percentage of our population being obese to a very large percentage of our population being obese, averaging 20 to as much as 30 percent in some states. That's not due to genetics. We know what causes that. Uh, that's caused uh, mostly by changes in diet and behavior. So, the genetic testing uh, for obesity may have some uh, utility, but certainly keeping track of what you put in your mouth and how much exercise uh, you perform will have a lot more utility than genetic testing in that specific case. So now I want to turn to uh, what kinds of things are tested for, and I've just picked off one website's uh, list of conditions and medication responses. And uh, the things that they test for will give you results for range from obesity and glaucoma, uh, to cancer, breast cancer, multiple sclerosis. Uh, but on the other side of things, they also will have some tests that specifically measure uh, your ability to metabolize certain drugs. Uh, so we have a range of tests. Some of these tests are measuring diseases where there's a slight uh, increase in disease given a specific variant, and some of them are measuring things where there's a very high increase in disease. This is just to show you what some results look like. And these are results, example results from 23andMe. They have a few individuals who agreed to uh, let their data be looked at by anybody. They've given them pseudonyms. Greg Mendel is uh, the dad in the family. Uh, and so you can look at Greg Mendel's data and look at what kinds of things you'd get. And what you'll see is they have one chart that shows you the likelihood of getting a given condition. In this case, we're looking at obesity. And it says uh, that if you're a European male of this particular age range, which is, I believe, 14 to 50 or so in the selected box up there, uh, the average male in the US has a 63.9% chance of being obese in the US at that age. Uh, where Greg Mendel, because he has a, a preferred mutation, uh, only has a 54.2% chance. And then on the lower panel, they're showing the relative risk conferred by the specific genotypes. Uh, and in this case, there's a, a modest factor of decrease in risk for obesity uh, due to the specific gene that's being measured. So now I want to turn a little bit to test accuracy and significance of the results. And I think about accuracy in a number of different ways. Uh, one is the analytical accuracy. And so that's something where if you send the sample repeatedly to the same place, or even in this case to different places, how accurate will the result be in terms of measuring the DNA variation that we're interested in? And the bottom line is these tests are highly accurate. The DNA variation is going to be measured with about 99 plus percent reproducibility, 99 percent greater than that uh, sensitivity. So we're going to measure almost all the SNPs. We're going to measure them very accurately. And if you send your DNA to different places and they measure the same SNP, they will get the same result almost all the time. Clinical accuracy is a little bit different beast. And in this case, what we're trying to say is, does this test accurately distinguish between alternate states of health. Uh, and that's a much more complicated thing, and it's mostly due to the linkage between the test result and the disease that goes through these population studies that have been done. And those population studies uh, vary in quality, vary in uh, amount of data, and not only that, the disease itself, it may not have a very huge uh, genetic component, like obesity as an example. And then the last thing uh, that I, in terms of accuracy or significance is clinical utility. And that's what really matters from uh, a test perspective is, is this test useful for decision making? Does it give you something you can do? And that's a much more complicated thing. 
Uh, for example, there are some diseases, even where there's great clinical accuracy and great analytical accuracy, like Huntington's, where there's very little that we can do about it uh, once you know you have it. And uh, then there's the other extremes too. Finally, I want to just mention briefly a few issues. Uh, as Anna's going to talk about in a minute, she'll talk about regulation. But for the most part, uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testing is largely unregulated or partially regulated to date. Uh, and that means that different labs will uh, give you back different results. They'll use different tests, different statistical methods. Uh, some will offer genetic counseling, some won't. And the net utility of a given test uh, isn't been cleared by the FDA or anybody. So the value of that test for decision making hasn't been vetted in any uh, standardized way. Interestingly, some companies like 23andMe will even allow users to share their data. Uh, so they're almost the Facebook of genetic testing where you can make your genetic uh, results available and other people can search on those test results. Uh, I want to point out one minor uh, issue. Maybe not so minor if you're the individual who's being surreptitiously tested. Uh, but you can send in any sample to these companies. You'll sign a form that says, this is from me, or whoever has uh, put this in place agreed to it. Uh, but nobody checks. So it's possible to do surreptitious testing and find out that perhaps the father of record is not your father of record. Um, the test results differ in probabilities, and they're dependent on ethnicities. So the ethnicity that you have determines to some extent what sort of information you get back and how reliable it is and how predictive it is. And uh, the fact of the matter is that a lot of genetic uh, testing to date has been done on the European population. So there are less predictive results if you're Asian or African American when you order these tests. And you can see that uh, just by looking at the test results on 23andMe site and selecting different ethnicities. So there's also a lot of other issues. Uh, the regulatory one is one of them. And uh, Anna will speak to you about uh, many of those. So thanks, thanks for including me um, on this panel. Um, my goal is here, well, I, you know, I was just thinking, you know, if somebody introduces you and says, well, it's largely unregulated, and you've been asked to talk about the regulatory context, I don't know, well, what am I going to say? Um, <laughs> but um, there is something to say. I mean, there's been considerable interest, and it's been growing in regulatory oversight. And that's been increasing at both the federal and the state level. Um, and so as the science advances, so has the interest been advancing. There's a perceived risk that these tests um, that are being offered to consumers are going to, that someone will take an action in reliance upon the test results. So with that, they're going to stop their medication, or maybe they'll stop taking preventive uh, measures that they should be taking otherwise. So as the, as the perceived risk has been increasing, as the science has developed, and as these tests become more specific um, and sensitive, uh, it, it, uh, the interest in regulation has increased significantly. Now, according to one study, uh, approximately 30 companies offer more than 400 genetic tests directly to consumers. And for many of these tests, you should recognize that there's, there can be little, if any, involvement of the healthcare provider in decision making around these tests. So this graphic here gives you a sense of the areas of federal and state regulatory attention to DTC testing. The vast majority of these laws apply to all genetic testing, but DTC is driving the interest in, at both the federal and the state level in additional oversight. So as you can see, I've divided the regulatory world into two areas. On one side, we have pre-market regulation, and that's through the federal government. And that's where they're looking at the test for, uh, their for its clinical value. Is it safe? Is it effective for the person who's the intended user? Um, now, very, very few, as you're going to see in just a minute, very few tests fall into this category where they receive pre-market review. But there is a potential for post-market review, although it is, again, limited. And it can be in the areas of laboratory quality. And they can be, uh, the regulators are looking at internet sites, and they're looking at marketing materials. And they're also, at the state level especially, they're developing some restrictions on what tests can be ordered in that state and by whom, and whether, for example, there needs to be a health care provider involved in that process. So 
Stepping back, looking at pre-market review, you can divide the world into commercially distributed test kits um, that are also known as IVDs or in vitro diagnostic devices. And on the other hand, we have laboratory uh, developed tests or LDTs or also referred to commonly as home brews, which sounds like somebody's brewing up the beer in their, in their basement there. But what it means is that the test kits can go out and be used by other labs, whereas the laboratory developed tests are used uh, strictly, you send the sample into that lab, it's conducted there, um, it's, it's all self-contained. So the test kits undergo FDA review as a medical device. So they do undergo some review for safety and effectiveness before they are allowed to leave the manufacturer. Unlike the LDTs, our home brews um, receive absolutely no pre-market review, and the vast majority of tests are LDTs. They're not IVDs. And I know I'm talking a lot of acronyms, but here you have it in front of you. So uh, the vast majority of these tests are LDTs, laboratory developed tests. They do not undergo pre-market review. Um, so who, who would decide uh, on the safety and effectiveness? Well, that would be a decision that would be made within the lab itself. Now, when we move to the post-market uh, side of things, laboratory quality is among those three areas of possible interest by regulators. So tests are designed, tests that are designed to assess patient health and inform medical decisions are regulated by a federal law known as CLIA, the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments of 1988. So what that means is these, this only applies to clinical labs. And what that means is that tests like ancestry testing are not subject to CLIA. But any other tests in which healthcare decisions are going to be made based on those, based on the results of those tests, like predisposition to Alzheimer's disease, are included under and must be conducted by a CLIA-approved lab. This is a law that's administered by CMS, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services at DHHS. They set quality standards and those requirements, the quality standards and proficiency standards, generally increase with the test complexity. However, there are no specific proficiency requirements for molecular or biochemical genetic testing labs. So normally, uh, you'd see CLIA overseeing personnel qualifications. They look at quality control for analytic validity, um, proficiency testing, et cetera, et cetera. But there's been a lot of controversy over the fact that there are no specific proficiency requirements for genetic testing, such as quality or staffing requirements. And this is very much unlike tests, diagnostic tests in microbiology or immunology or clinical chemistry. And in fact, there was a 2006 petition to the CMS um, that was requesting that standards for genetic testing specialty be developed and implemented. And it was denied in 2006 for cost reasons. So the CLIA regulations leave the permissibility of whether a state wants to pursue and regulate in the area of lab quality, leaves that to the states. OK, so um, another important point is that CLIA doesn't distinguish between facilities performing uh, direct access testing, DTC, and provider ordering, ordered testing. It, it's not relevant to them. They're focused on the lab quality. So as I was saying, the CLIA regulations leave the permissibility of DTC to the discretion of individual states. And there are state public health labs that are out there in some states that regulate the licensure of personnel and facilities that perform genetic tests. And among the most stringent are those in California and in New York. And in fact, in 2009, um, there was, a, I believe it was the, both of those labs uh, issued cease and desist letters to 13 genetic testing labs. What this means, if something is regulated at the state level, what this means is that if a company wants to uh, receive specimens from a New York resident, then they have to be independently certified by that New York laboratory authority. So that lab that's doing that work has to be independently certified. Um, so these particular, um, New York and California in particular, are very stringent requirement. Um, it's worth noting that CDC advises CMS on CLIA implementation through something known as EGAP, the Evaluation of Genomic Applications in Prevention and uh, Practice and Prevention. Um, <clears throat> and basically, they come up with recommendations on the validity and utility of the genetic test. 
However, it's not binding on labs or test manufacturers, but it's intended to inform physicians and also to inform insurers so they can make their decisions on whether they're going to reimburse. Now, uh, again, on the post-marketing side, advertising and marketing of DTC tests is subject to federal and state oversight. And the focus of their attention is on consumer protection. So they want to prevent and prosecute fraud, and they want to um, prosecute false and misleading claims about tests. They're protecting the consumer. So these laws are enforced by the Federal Trade Commission through their specific act, and the FDA and the CDC is involved, too. Um, there are also uh, state attorney general's offices and departments of health that are implementing specific laws at the state level. Now, arguably, why are they focused on DTC? They're not focused on DTC, but DTC is interesting to them and has gotten their attention because typically the most, and arguably, the most outrageous claims about genetic testing are generally coming from DTC companies marketing directly to consumers. So, for example, the claim that the sex of a child can be determined five weeks into the pregnancy is not supported by scientific evidence, but was something that it was um, advertised that way. Um, now, with respect to test ordering restrictions, states also have the authority to regulate tests by restricting how those orders are taken. So they can require the participation of or consultation with a healthcare professional. So often this is accomplished through medical licensure laws, but also laws targeted directly at DTC companies. So here we have um, just, this is from the Genetics and Public Policy Center. Uh, this, is, this is from 2008, so things may have changed, but it is 2008, so it's not too old. Essentially, at this time, half of the states permitted direct-to-consumer lab testing with no restrictions. So they allowed labs in their states to test without any restrictions. Uh, 13 states prohibited DTC testing entirely, and 12, permitted, um, 12 states permitted um, only uh, testing for specific types of tests, which tended to exclude genetic tests. Um, also recognize that there is in every state, there is professional regulation of the practice of medicine. And so whether a laboratory is practicing clinical medicine has become an issue at the state level. Um, but when they were developing these laws, they didn't consider the fact that DTC companies can go out and hire a physician. If they're requiring a physician to be involved in the decision making, the physicians can be employed in states by the DTC company in order to, to actually facilitate the order in order to circumvent uh, the practice of medicine restrictions. So that's an issue that has received some interesting attention. Um, just recognize that both internet, cross-border sales, um, and so on, that complicates the enforcement of state laws. What do you do when somebody crosses state laws? What do you do when the New York resident having talked to a colleague of mine who works at 23andMe, um, what, do you, what do you do if you want to get a New York resident to offer you a, uh, a specimen? Well, can't they just go to New Jersey, go over the state line, do the little swab, mail it from New Jersey? Isn't that sufficient? So, um, and then set up a mailbox and get it in New Jersey or have it sent to a friend? So keep that in mind. It's hard to, hard to assess how far these regulations can go. Now, as I warned you, regulatory attention, despite the lack of regulation or the, the minimal regulation uh, ongoing at the moment, um, regulatory attention has begun to shift. And this is evident uh, first in 2006. And the reason that there's been a shift over time is that when medical devices were first regulated, whenever that was in the 1970s, right? Whenever, when medical devices were first regulated, the tools that we had to do that, the medical devices we were talking about were simple. And it was the accuracy of the results. The accuracy of the results was really more dependent on the, the person and the expert, the, the expert who was going to interpret those results. So the test results were reported to a physician who was actively involved of the patient in the care of the patient being treated. And now, of course, the environment has changed. So these LDTs or these direct-to-consumer tests are being used to assess high-risk conditions. Some of them rely on novel scientific findings. Um, there may even be automated interpretation rather than relying on experts to interpret. 
Um, and so it, it, the whole system gets removed from the patient's care. Um, so this has escalated the potential, at least from the perception of the regulators, has escalated the potential for risk to the patient. So patients, again, may make decisions that adversely affect their health in reliance on these tests. So what you see here in this FTC fa facts for consumers, they're like, in 2006, they said, well, you know, you're marketing these nutritional tests, and it's genetics tests. They were genetics tests, and they were trying to offer advice on nutrition. So it wasn't quite bad enough to get their serious attention, but it was serious enough to get three agencies together to send out an advisory to consumers. Um, so this is a healthy dose of skepticism may be the best prescription. So they want to make sure that you're advised to be careful with these genetic tests. Now, um, you heard earlier about uh, the, the pathway test. Walgreens decided in May of 2010 not to sell this over-the-counter genetic test, which the test uh, offered um, an opportunity to determine your predisposition to Alzheimer's, diabetes, obesity. It might inform your reproduction as to whether you're a carrier for CF, Tay-Sachs, other diseases, um, and so on. And so what happened here is that the FDA sent out a little note. And they said, does your test require FDA authorization? Is it an LDT or is it an IVD? So, and remember, the IVD is the test kit requires pre-market regulation. And so the company's argument back to the FDA was that, OK, we admit that the consumers are collecting their own DNA. So yeah, that's kind of an IVD, but we're doing the testing at our own lab. So that's an LDT. Therefore, no pre-market regulation is needed, and then you heard. So essentially, FDA was, was trying to send a message that they thought that the marketing was unlawful, and ultimately that was withdrawn. Um, the FDA then in July of this year sent, uh, 20, sent letters to 20 genetic test manufacturers doing kind of the same thing, say, hmm, we think that your products meet the statutory definition of a medical device because of your claims about the test results. And so they are forcing them to come back to them and say, why are these not IVDs? Um, FDA uh, spoke in July to Congress and said, hey, we're going to go after the LDTs. We have authority to regulate them. But we've been, in, we've been exercising enforcement discretion. Things have really changed over time. There's a risk of inaccurate results. So we're just giving you a heads up that we've looked out there at the LDTs and there are problems out there. Um, lastly, uh, on the GAO report, there was a GAO report, and this is great. Um, they sent out samples, and great from an intellectual standpoint, sorry. Um, but they sent out identical DNA, and what they found is the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, is that by sending out these different samples, they got back different results from different companies. So one person with the same sample, so they sent out one sample, and one person was told that they were below average, and then they were average, and then they were at above average risk for prostate cancer and hypertension. So three different interpretation. Um, and they found that results conflicted with the donor's factual illnesses and the family medical histories. Um, it, you know, it goes on and on. Um, there was one where uh, for, uh, I think I'm just going to leave it there, but there were a lot of misleading test results as a result. So that came to Congress's attention. Bottom line is there have been critiques of the current regime that it's not uniform or comprehensive. Uh, we have to, there's no assurance of clinical validity or utility. There's no genetic specialty, as I mentioned, and there's no required proficiency testing program. So there are concerns without, about having no or minimal oversight. Health dollars are being spent poorly. Maybe the tests aren't valid or that they may be performed incorrectly by labs. Maybe the results are even going to be explained inaccurately by physicians. So people may be taking, um, they may undergo harmful treatments or unnecessary treatment. And ultimately, there may just be an erosion of public trust in genetic tests. But that has to be balanced, of course, against the possible downsides of more regulation. Maybe it's going to delay our access to new tests, or the tests are going to cost more, or there may be decreased innovation. So that is my summary of regulation in a nutshell. So I'm happy to take questions at the end. 
Thank you. Um, it's, it's a pleasure for me to follow uh, Roger and Anna after their presentations because it allows me to kind of uh, focus in on some of the, uh, the ethical and social issues related to this. What, one thing I would like to begin with is by saying, in terms of my perspective in bioethics, I like to look at issues from multiple perspectives. So what I hope to do through my presentation is give you an idea of different ways of looking at these questions that you've been hearing about on the last two presentations. And in fact, I'd like to start by talking about direct-to-consumer advertisements for genetics as a way of introducing this topic, so, which really has been going on for decades. In fact, the first paper I recall uh, from my own reading was from 1982, a paper regarding uh, Tay-Sachs screening and the way in which um, messages were manipulated uh, in the Tay-Sachs screening programs from the 1970s. Um, advertisements tend to simplify complex issues and diseases, and they appeal to a wide range of emotions and draw upon a variety of themes. I'll give you some examples of these. So um, community identification is one of the themes. Um, the desire for control over one's health and health care options. The powerful hope for health. This is some examples from newborn screening. Um, the motivation to relieve fear. This is a, um, from the inside uh, flap of uh, the show Wit about, about uh, cancer. And the resolution of uncertainty. This is from a billboard in uh, Baltimore. Um, so you can see that um, advertisements have been used in a variety of ways uh, uh, for many years. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, colleagues and I spent some time thinking about this and tried to think about this generally from the question of under what circumstances or conditions is direct-to-consumer advertising most concerning. And we identified three specific uh, types of situations where it could be more concerning than others. And what I'd like to do is show you uh, how genetic testing fits into those examples. So first we can think about the complicated social context of genetics. Uh, here there are several issues. First is the fact that in general consumers are less experienced with genetics th than they might be for pharmaceuticals. Um, and, and in that regard, uh, their experience and exposure is often uh, fueled by um, uh, mass media metaphors. Uh, we see this on time all the time magazine and Newsweek, as well as fictional narratives such as Gattaca. That's really often what's informing the public about this. Um, there may be a limited appreciation that can also reinforce misconceptions. So uh, there, may, there often is an inflative hope and expectations of genetics. Um, in fact, one of the brochures talked about a simple test that may dispel fear, which often ignores the complexity that Roger talked about between gene environment, behavioral, and social interactions. Um, and it's also important to realize that the historical context of genetics, particularly with regards to eugenics and sterilization, um, is not too far in our past. Uh, and that also creates a, a complexity that we need to be aware of. Um, the advertisements often fail to address the informational complexity. Uh, the, information, the risk information that Roger was describing is often difficult to understand. Um, the advertisements uh, may describe the most severe clinical manifestation of a condition. And they may not include information about potential either so psychosocial, familial, or physical harms that could occur. Um, and perhaps most importantly is the issue of lack of consensus about the clinical utility of some of these tests, and that the fact that these tests can become commercially available uh, before there is a professional and public consensus about a test value. And again, this is true not just for DTC, but true even for things that are offered by uh, uh, physicians as well. So what I'd like to do now is turn from the issue of advertising more specifically to the issue of direct sales. Uh, here's one of my uh, favorite cartoons here. It says, I'd, uh, it's great for this time of year. I'd like to order uh, item 9477B, the do-it-yourself chromosome manipulation makeover kit with a cloning adapter. Oh, what the heck? A set of frozen identical twins in blonde. Um, so to think about uh, issues of DTC sales, what I'd like to do is to, is to show you this slide. Um, to describe these four different types of categories of products that perhaps we may have different implications when we think about the issue of provider advertising, uh, DTC advertising, as well as DTC sales. And what I've shown you on this slide are these four categories of conventional, innovative, complementary, and recreational. One could place genetic testing in the innovative category, although as I'll show you in a moment, even genetic testing can expand to all four of these categories. But the idea here is that we wouldn't be so upset about some of the advertising for things that we think of as complementary. So when somebody advertises 
um, a day spa for $200 a day. We don't get too bothered by that. And certainly I've never heard anybody getting terribly upset about the pet psychics who advertise and talk about how they can communicate to your pets who have deceased so you can learn more about what their experience is like. We, we have some opportunity to accept those, perhaps because as Anna described, we're expecting people are not going to make important health care decisions based upon what the pet psychic tells them uh, uh, their, their cat is thinking about them or what their day is like at the day spa. So when we think about genetic testing, um, there are some, uh, even for the DTC, there are some or companies that offer what are otherwise thought of as more conventional tests. Some are more uh, innovative. Uh, this is one for pharmacogenomics. Um, some are ones I would describe more in the complementary. Here's one that um, uh, relates to vitamins and offers a variety of products that you can buy. And finally, a number of years ago, Target uh, also offered um, a kit uh, for you to store your DNA. Um, and then the, there was a, it was $29 for you, and it was uh, $100 for the family pack. Um, now, the co companies who offer these range of tests argue that consumers really ought to have access to, their, to genetic knowledge now. It's their information. They're the ones who have the right to have it. And it's up to others to explain why they can't have access to this information. So here's an example of some of the, uh, the quotes from some of the companies. I want to call your attention actually to the two at the bottom. Um, Individuals recognize that scientific advances is a continual process. Nonetheless, the information which exists should be made available to individuals and who will benefit from the information derived from genomic research and other forms of health research, much of which has been publicly funded. So they're making the claim that, look, this information is out there, and we've paid for it. We should be able to get this, um, and that, in fact, consumers are capable of making these complicated, sophisticated decisions. Um, I think what's also important to realize is that similar to what these quotes are getting at is, in fact, information means different things to different people. And so there will be some people who really do care about this, the test for obesity that Roger was describing, regardless of whether how predictive or how meaningful it is. To them, it's information that they think is either uh, uh, important to them. And so I think we can distinguish both between what's clinically as, and personally uh, meaningful. And also we can distinguish between what's important versus just interesting. And some of the stuff may just be interesting even if it's not important, but that doesn't tell us whether we, it's appropriate to offer this or not. What I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time um, talking briefly about some of the types of concerns for individuals, from, particularly from these more unconventional applications. We've heard a bit about this. Um, and I think perhaps the um, most important one is the one that Anna mentioned, which is the third one here, is that people may alter their health behavior in inappropriate ways. Um, and I think one, uh, another uh, concern that I have is uh, the potential for exploitation who have cognitive impairments and limited appreciation uh, of genetics. And here you know, we have the example of the people who, um, with cognitive impairments who every day um, receive the brochure from Publishers Clearinghouse that they've already won, and every day send their check-in for more money because they keep on thinking they're winning. Um, and so while most of us are, can, can, are sophisticated enough to appreciate when a genetic test is like a pet psychic, but there may be some people who will take this information literally because of those uh, problems, and we don't have a good way of protecting uh, those folks. Um, perhaps more importantly than the, the issues of, of individuals, from my perspective, are the public health implications. Um, and I think one of the things we have no idea of is what the pre prevalence of this direct sale is. To the best of my impression is that this is probably pretty minimal. We see it on the web, but that doesn't tell us how often people are doing this. And my hunch is that this is actually probably pretty um, low use. The concern would be if the use increased, and the particular concern would be the cascade effect of other tests that might, and other interventions that might be necessary because of uh, what people do with the, the test information. I want to keep us moving along, so I'm not going to go through this slide in any detail. The point of this and the next two slides is to suggest from a public health setting, based upon that categorization I described to you of conventional and innovative, uh, there are issues related to both marketing and service delivery that may vary uh, with the, the test examples. Um, and those may be less problematic in some ways uh, in the recreational than, for example, in the, um, the standard approach. In fact, that's really perhaps my main point here is that I think that 
conventional and recreational are not as problematic as the innovative and complementary tests might be. And in fact, probably the innovative tests, the ones that are closer to prime time, are perhaps most concerning because unless we really establish that they are meaningful, those are the ones we're going to see the problem uh, with uh, inappropriate health care utilization. The problem is it's not clear which category necessarily a particular test should be placed under. And in fact, companies will often offer tests for different categories. So for example, um, here's, here's a, one of my favorite ones from a number of years ago uh, for, um, for children um, who may have uh, genetic traits that lead to disruptive and addictive personalities. Um, and they claim that the testing will help you manage your child's behavior. We, I wish it would only be so easy. Um, is this innovative? Is this complementary? Is this recreational? Um, Here's 23andMe, again, innovative, complementary, recreational. What's going on here uh, with this company? What do they think they're actually doing? Um, we don't really know what impact uh, these technologies will have. Um, and there's a need for further research. We need to know uh, how much public and provider interest there is. We need, to, what, we need to know more about public understanding. And we need to know what the impact will be on the, on the public and the healthcare system. I'm going to guess and speculate what I think that data will show once we have it. Um, there's not going to be a whole lot of interest, although that could be influenced by marketing. There's not going to be a whole lot of understanding. Maybe that's malleable to education. I also don't think it's going to have a big impact on people's lives. I think it's going to be difficult to distinguish uh, from the wide range of social, environmental, cultural, geographic, and economic influences that have an impact on us. And I don't think this is going to be the thing that's going to completely revolutionize our world. Um, I do think that particularly in terms of adverse impact, that's going to be diminished in general as these tests do become more routine. So let me end by saying that regardless of regulation, that uh, the public will need advice and information and, re and recommendations about how to approach genetic information. So I'm, I'm very appreciative of the work in the last few years by the, uh, the various uh, government authorities that Anna was talking about who are getting more interested in this. At the same time, regardless of this, individuals will need advice about under what circumstances is genetic testing helpful or not. And um, I think this is going to become a much more complicated issue in the future because as the costs go down, people will be able to have access to essentially their entire genomic sequence. And so we'll have to reframe the question. And it will be, which information, at what time, why? And I think this whole issue of DTC testing will um, essentially go away. So those are my comments. I guess, you know, a, a way to challenge this is I'm, I'm very curious um, how you would answer if you had an opportunity for a family pack of DNA testings for each of you right now, you each had the option to purchase a pack for your family, would you do it? And if not, what from your perspective would prevent you from doing it or what would perhaps uh, inspire you to be able to do it in a future time, time some point in the future? I'll say it go par partially uh, tongue in cheek, but more seriously, the family pack that I saw before, that $99, I'd rather take that bottle and buy a really nice, take that, that money and buy a really nice <laughs> bottle of wine. I think I got a lot more enjoyment out of that than this. Um, that's partly jokingly, but partly seriously. I think, I think the issue is that the value is not that great. If somebody else, instead of spending $100 on a bottle of wine, wants to buy that, that's okay with me too. Yeah. Well, I mean, recently with that Black Friday uh, marketing from 23andMe, it was $99. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and that meant I did have the opportunity to buy it and could have easily afforded that for my whole family if I had wanted to, and I didn't. Uh, the reasons for that are similar to Ben's. I like wine, too. Uh, <laughs> but also, uh, right now, I don't think the information, you know, the connection between those tests and something that's going to be actionable gives me a good sense of what to do is there. But that's going to change. And you know, 23andMe has a subscription model. You can give them five bucks a month, and every month that some new test results or new interpretation of those tests become available, they will send you email updates. And it won't be forever uh, until uh, these tests start to have more and more meaningful results mm -hmm. and more and more actionable uh, things can be done with them. Eric Lander actually estimates that there's about 3,000 genetic tests which provide use, useful or could potentially provide useful, actionable uh, results. And so that's going to change And that the more genetic testing that's done, the more uh, sequencing that's done, the more we're going to know. So I don't think it's a, 
you know, my, my reasons right now will be different in another few years, and I'll probably do it then. I would agree with that. At this point, for me personally, the value, uh, the, the analytic validity is not assured, the clinical validity is not assured, and certainly the clinical utility is not assured. And uh, to certainly, if, uh, it would be a personal decision for myself, but it's not one that I would want to make for my family members. And I have enough to worry about with, sorry, you know, if my kids are watching. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have a, you know, they keep me busy enough as it is, uh, staying on top of them. Let's just make sure the homework gets done. No. Thank you all for really interesting presentations. I am personally astounded that, that these aren't regulated by the FDA. And I mean, it was the FDA's, um, it's the FDA's goal to protect the public from health issues, and that's why they came to be in 1906, because of people selling anything anywhere with any claim. So I'm really astounded that it's taken so long to start this moving along and that they couldn't automatically um, regulate these tests. Um, so I, I wanted to know where that's going, if more progress is being made with FDA regulating IVDs. And I also, I have another question, but maybe you want to answer that first. Well, it, with respect to LDTs, because the IVDs are regulated, right? So with respect to the LDTs, the home brews, as they call them, FDA, as of this summer, has indicated that they're planning to have a public hearing, in, and they want to seek the advice of the public on whether they should be pursuing this, and probably any interested parties. So there may be a notice in the Federal Register with respect to that. I don't know off the top of my head. So they are pursuing it. They've indicated to Congress that they will be pursuing um, an, uh, a plan or coming up with a plan to exercise a regulatory authority in that area. So. Yeah, I just think of my own doctor. I, I get my results from my doctor of any test. I don't get anything just in the mail. So, uh, My other comment was about roles of societies that uh, represent geneticists and what are they saying. I'm a member of ISSCR, which is International Society for Stem Cell Research, and they're doing a lot in the field of um, DTC advertising of so-called stem cell treatments, and they're doing a lot to expose uh, fraudulent treatments. And I was wondering what the societies were doing, like the American Society for Human Genetics, if they are taking a role in trying to expose mm -hmm. the issues yeah. and, and helping consumers. Yeah, they actually, those, those organizations actually have made very explicit public, public and published statements uh, raising concerns about these. So they are, are on record as being expressing concerns about them. You know, I, I would say though it's, it, it's complex. It's not the, um, and I think the reason why it becomes complex is that bec as I was showing in my slides, it becomes unclear in some cases what's trying to be accomplished with these. And I think it's, it's as they get, get close to making strong healthcare claims that it becomes more worrisome. But a lot of these companies really see themselves no different from going to Whole Foods and buying a bunch of stuff that, we, that people are charged more for because of the thought that it might be, quote, better. And I think that's what becomes ambiguous is, 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 is this like going to Whole Foods or is this really being taken advantage of as you're describing in the early 1900s with snake oil? I have another question if that's okay. <laughs> Um, I am intrigued by this sort of concept of right to know, and I was wondering if I, if I could hear something about the legal perspective on this. Do people have a right to know this information? Can they argue that legally, that they should be able to get genetic information directly if they want to? Sort of as a, I don't know, First Amendment, is it a First Amendment right of these companies the company, to yeah, even the company, offer these? Or yeah, it would be the what are the arguing exactly? A First the companies would be arguing a First Amendment. As far as whether there's an individual right to know this information, no, that would be an affirmative right. And there are not a lot of affirmative rights out there um, in, in the law. Um, so just off the top of my head, no. But I'm sure I'll get a little note from someone correcting me, as I do sometimes. But off the top of my head, I. I there isn't necessarily a right to know this information. There's a right to be, uh, to ensure that it's accurate so that if someone is misled, if something we didn't talk about is the role of the judiciary in, in enforcing uh, laws or medical malpractice in using negligence law in order to uh, enforce 
uh, a regulatory environment on a company. So if they mislead a consumer and they're able to uh, raise that claim, even in a class, I, there's been at least one class action that's been filed on that basis uh, for misleading information that people took action. So I, it's not, not a direct right. I think we could have uh, Ben's perspective on the ethical mm -hmm. right as mm -hmm. a final word on this session. Well, sure, that'll take me a half hour. No, <laughs> but no, but but I think I think the, the I think what is I think you're right, Nick. That that, that one of the tensions is a, is a sense from uh, consumers that this is information that's about them, and so they see strong some some individual consumers, and you can imagine the the, the paradigmatic, well-conformed person who wants to know stuff, who really gets it all and is not going to be misled. He might just say, "I want to know this." Um, even the regulations themselves really have to do with regulations that often talk about advertising and accuracy. So there's, I'm sure there'll be opportunities for those folks who really want to know stuff to find that stuff out. I think we're, the issue that we're really focusing on is more when well, this gets applied in a much more broader public health consumer context than what an individual person might want to pursue on their own in some way. Mm -hmm.